I am Jennifer Gordon, the Managing Editor and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Welcome to the launch of the Atlantic Council's new report, Advancing U.S. ROK Cooperation on Nuclear Energy. We have a truly outstanding panel that will draw out the key points and key takeaways from the report. First, however, I am honored to introduce this session's keynote speaker, Ambassador Thomas Graham, Jr. Ambassador Graham is the architect of the Non-Proliferation Treaties Extension, and he is a fierce advocate for the peaceful use of nuclear energy and the recognition that nuclear power is a key tool in the fight against climate change. He served on the International Advisory Board of the Nuclear Program of the United Arab Emirates, and he is the chairman of the board of Lightbridge Corporation. Ambassador Graham is the co-chairman of the Atlantic Council's Nuclear Energy and National Security Coalition and, because of his work with the Atlantic Council, I am privileged to call him a colleague and friend. Now I'm delighted to introduce, I'm delighted to introduce him. Ambassador Graham, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening um, to our audience in Washington and uh, good morning to our audience in the Republic of Korea. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this discussion. Congratulations to Stephen Green and the Atlantic Council on the launch of the new report, Advancing U.S. ROK Cooperation on Nuclear Energy. Those of you who know me are aware that I've devoted my life's work to nuclear arms control and non-proliferation and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. From 1970 to 1997, I worked on behalf of the US government in every major international arms control and nuclear non-proliferation negotiation involving the US, helping to establish international trust in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. I played an integral, an integral role in the 1995 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Extension, which along with New START is the principal remaining major nuclear arms control agreement. The NBT and its mandatory safeguards, a system of international atomic energy inspection and verification, ensuring the peaceful use of nuclear materials, provides the explicit legal right to nuclear power to all NPT partners. I am a champion of nuclear energy as a key tool in the fight against climate change, while at the same time meeting global energy demand. Nuclear energy can decarbonize the global power system, and it also has the potential to decarbonize hard to abate sectors, especially uh, uh, desalinization and uh, industrial heat. However, it is critical that as new to nuclear countries work to start nuclear energy programs, and as countries with existing programs uh, um, seek to acquire the next generation of nuclear reactors, the United States and its allies are the leading vendors of the international nuclear market. The US and the Republic of Korea have an established record of success in the bilateral trade of components and services, research, development, and demonstration of advanced nuclear energy technologies in collaboration in third countries. Uh, I have seen this firsthand, especially when I served from 2009 until 2016 on the International Advisory Board established by the United Arab Emirates, uh, 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 by the United Arab Emirates Peaceful Nuclear Program 
to warrant that the new program built with KEPCO reactors was making progress and maintaining the highest standards of safety, security, non-proliferation, transparency, and sustainability in construction of the Baraka nuclear power plant. The IAB and its original, originally nine, now seven members at the end, uh, including my dear friend, Dr. Kun Mo Chung, uh, provided oversight to the UAE's nuclear energy program, which was the first country to begin such a program in nearly three decades without already having had nuclear power reactors. I applauded from afar last summer as the first of Baraka's four units came online and began providing power in the UAE. Baraka will ultimately account for 25% of the UAE's electricity by producing 5,600 megawatts of clean energy, and it will eliminate emissions equivalent <clears throat> to removing 3.2 million cars off the road annually. If you believe that the threat of climate change is real, which I do, and if you believe that the threat is here and now and not in some distant future, which I also do, then you will believe in the utmost importance of building nuclear reactors well and building them quickly. The Republic of Korea has demonstrated that it has the capability to do the both. And it is therefore an indispensable civil nuclear partner for the United States. Over the years in my life and career, I have met, met many of the leaders of Korea's civil nuclear community. In addition to Dr. Kun Mo Chung, the senior statesman of Korea's nuclear community, this includes men and women such as Il Sun Kwang, uh, Professor Emeritus at Seoul National University, and Florence Lo, Lo Lee, with whom I've been privileged to work on many significant projects here in Washington. From my work with the International Board in the UAE to my work now as Chairman of the Board of Directors of Lightbridge Corporation, I am motivated each day by my desire to mitigate climate change. And I believe that nuclear power has a crucial role to play. Nuclear energy, in my opinion, is the only energy source on the scene that can provide clean, reliable, baseload energy in the US and globally. In these efforts, our need for our international friends and allies has never been clearer. I'm now delighted to turn the floor back to Jennifer Gordon, who will introduce and moderate today's panel on how the United States and the Republic of Korea can collaborate on civil nuclear research and development, bilateral trade, and bilateral cooperation. Ambassador Graham, thank you so much. It is always such a privilege to hear you speak and to have the opportunity to learn from you. Now I'm delighted to introduce this panel of experts for this conversation. First, I'd like to introduce Stephen Green, who is a non-resident senior fellow of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and the author of the report that we're launching today. Next, John Hopkins, the chairman and CEO of New Scale Power. Next, I'd like to introduce Hong Hyu Kang, the general manager of nuclear marketing and sales from Doosan Heavy Industries and Construction. And finally, Jai Su Ryu, 
the Director of International Relations at the Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute. So I'd like to turn, Steve, first to you um, as the author of the report. And I'd like you to please provide a brief overview of where you see the United States civil nuclear industry today. Sure, Jennifer. Um, well, as Ambassador Graham mentioned, nuclear power is a key tool to address uh, climate change. Uh, it provides over half of U.S. zero carbon power. Uh, but the industry in the U.S. is challenged. Uh, existing nu nuclear generation in many regions of the country suffers from the effects of uh, low gas prices that drive prevailing power prices in many regions. Uh, and also from structural aspects of U.S. power markets and the policies that have been applied uh, to renewable generation. Uh, thousands of megawatts of nuclear generation have been retired prematurely, and more are expected to close in the future or under threat of closure as a result of those effects. Um, in addition, unfortunately, there have been high profile difficulties with some recent new uh, construction of large nuclear power plants. Uh, folks may be familiar with the, uh, the difficulties in, in Georgia with the Vogel plant, um, which is being completed, and also in South Carolina, where the plant was canceled. Um, in contrast, uh, the operations at nuclear power plants has been uh, strong, very effective. Uh, capacity factors, which are a measure of how much of the potential generation was actually uh, uh, created or, or generated, uh, capacity factors increased from in the 70% range in, 19, in the 1990s uh, up to over 90%, about 93% in 2019, uh, which just means that there's more clean power available. And also the industry uh, was able to achieve up rates, increases in the capacity of existing plants uh, of about 4,000 megawatts in the last 20 years, and that's equivalent to bringing four new units online. So even though there haven't been new units built, there have been a lot of a lot effectively created uh, through up rates. There is uh, extensive uh, activity in advanced reactor development, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that uh, during this uh, program. Uh, with as many as 70 initiatives tracked by uh, the Third Way organization uh, and a number of projects poised for demonstration under uh, Department of Energy programs. And in addition, there have been uh, several pieces of legislation and policy changes supporting uh, nuclear RD&D, including support for uh, advanced nuclear energy. Uh, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program in particular intended to achieve operations of several projects uh, uh, demonstration projects in the next several years. Uh, in addition, I want to call out the reauthorization of the Export Import Bank, which helps with nuclear exports, uh, and the change in policy at the Development Finance Corporation, which enables development support for nuclear exports. Uh, and uh, early indications are that the Biden administration will continue to support nuclear energy as part of its efforts on climate. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Kong, I'd like to turn to you and could you talk to us a little bit about Korea's new energy policy? Um, and if possible, could you also discuss Doosan's nuclear energy business strategy within that context? Mr. Kong, would you mind unmuting yourself? Thank you. As Mr. Green summarized in the new report, the government decided to phase out nuclear power in Korea and trying to construct massive solar and wind power plants so that construction of a new nuclear power plant, such as planned Shinhanu Unit 1 and 2, was stopped. Licensed renewal, which is actively performed in the United States, also could not be happened in Korea. Therefore, suppliers in Korea are in a very difficult situation. Tucson is trying to survive by participating in SMR development and supplying spent fuel gas and expanding nuclear services. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And now for the view from the US nuclear industry, um, from within that industry, Mr. Hopkins, um, can you shed some light on what the private sector sees um, you know, of, of the, the nuclear industry in the United States? You know, Mr. Green just stated there's some 70 reactors right now vying for position in the light water, uh, non-light water, micro reactor space. And if you think just a short five, six years ago, many would have said there is no nuclear going forward. There certainly is no market for small modular reactors. In that short period of time, um, the, the circumstances have changed dramatically. And I got to say that, um, you know, New Scale has been around a while going through the process that when we received the award in 2014 under Secretary Energy Ernie Moniz, and then carried it through today, um, we've been able to get to the NRC rigor. And it, it was an, a lot of rigor. But I'm also excited to see the whole advanced reactor community stepping up. When I say advanced reactor community, I include the Passive Safety Advanced uh, Westinghouse AP1000, the GEH small module reactor, and the advanced reactors that are non-light water that are going through the process today. There, there was an announcement today that I read under the um, the Advanced uh, Reactor Demonstration Program. One of the non-light waters has just been awarded a significant award. So what Mr. Green said as relates to this administration carrying forward uh, this community of, of reactors within the United States is extremely important. I see it only moving forward because the groundswell around the world is for um, energy security, climate disruption, and areas that uh, the ambassador stated in parts of the world that need energy for desalinization. We're seeing significant response in terms of both blue and green hydrogen production. That takes a lot of energy. We see our labs stepping up, and they've always been there. Uh, INL and you know that we've worked extensively with. All of the labs are stepping up and promoting what we're doing. So it, it's a good time, I believe. We're at a tipping point, and I understand proofs in the pudding, but I think it's a good time to be in this country in the advanced nuclear industry. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Um, you know, I think what I'm taking away, especially from your remarks, is that there is this momentum. Um, and I think that, you know, that's probably due to perhaps the quiet efforts of a lot of people who have worked on this, even at times when the outcomes may have seemed a little bit bleak. Um, and so I think that, you know, something that I want to really turn to in this conversation is the nature of R&D cooperation bilateral trade, because I think that this is something that has continued and that will continue. Um, and Mr. Ryu, I want to turn to you and ask you, Korea and the United States have had a long history of nuclear R&D cooperation, and both countries recognize this as a very important partnership. So could you share the current status of nuclear cooperation between the two countries and the key advances that you see? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, currently, there are many government uh, channels of R&D collaboration between the two countries as follows. Joint Standing Committee on Nuclear Energy Cooperation, JASNEC, has a central forum for government-to-government -government cooperation since 1976. The permanent co coordinating group has dealt with the cooperation in the areas of safeguards, physical protection, and export control since 1994. The, INR, uh, the, the International Nuclear Energy Research Initiative, or INR, since 2001, and the High Level Bilateral Commission that was established in 2016 based on the 25 ROK US 123 agreement. Since 2010, the ROK US have been conducting the several important R&D projects. At first, ROK and the United States have been conducting the verification of the technical feasibility, economic viability, and the non-proliferation acceptability of bioprocessing technology using span fuel through the joint fuel cycle studies uh, since 2011. Uh, through the JFCS, two countries are making progress to develop the, of the technology option in terms of spent management. And second, the 
Kerry has also been co cooperating with the ANL, our national laboratory, for the development of prototype gem for sodium cooled fast reactor or PGSFR as an advanced nuclear reactor in our case since 2012. Now, RK is now approaching the phase of applying for uh, applying for a license for the development of PGSFR and as a built a supply chain for the PGS through cooperation with the Korean industries. Lastly, in the, in the margin of the 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit, the US and Korea has, have launched multinational R&D cooperation to convert high, highly enriched uranium into the high density, low enriched uranium as a nuclear fuel for research reactor that are using still the HEU. I would like to especially note that the National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA, awarded the certification of appreciation to carry for its contribution toward the global HEU minimization last October. Uh, these are very important projects for the two, two countries to uh, uh, for, for from the um, advanced nuclear technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ryu. Um, I want to go to Mr. Green and ask you, based on your research, what do you see as some of the areas with the most potential for U.S. ROK cooperation? And I know, Mr. Ryu, um, you just mentioned research reactors, and I know that this is a key theme as well from the report. So, Mr. Green, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, perhaps the strongest opportunities are, the, are in the area of uh, research development and demonstration. Uh, Mr. Ryu just uh, mentioned uh, ongoing research, and I think much of that continues. Um, there, uh, there are certainly opportunities to cooperate in the development of advanced reactors, uh, such as the support that uh, Doosan has provided to NuScale and that uh, has also been provided uh, by Kerry, I believe, and, and Hyundai uh, to Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, uh, among others. Uh, that, that type of support helps to share risk and, and develop supply chains. Uh, and uh, I'll also call out that uh, there is some interest in the US in potentially making uh, investment of that, of that uh, nature. Uh, similar to what uh, uh, Doosan made uh, easier in terms of uh, 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 making it uh, possible for foreign ownership to be uh, uh, increased uh, subject to appropriate controls. Um, the, uh, the U.S., one of the areas that the U.S. Uh, is potentially pursuing is, uh, is a uh, project called the Versatile Test Reactor to, uh, to test, uh, to assist in evaluating uh, advanced reactor technologies, and uh, that will be uh, if it's uh, if it's moved forward uh, a pretty expensive proposition, uh, and so it, there will be opportunities for uh, uh, bilateral cooperation to help uh, address the the uh, the cost of that in exchange for uh, research opportunities. Uh, in addition, of course, there are opportunities uh, to. Uh, improve bilateral trade in uh, civil nuclear and uh, potentially uh, to uh, cooperate further in exports to third countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. Um, I think that this notion that you brought up of multinational investment is a really good one, and I want to stay on this issue for just a moment. Um, Mr. Hung, I want to go back to you and ask, you know, New Scale recently has entered into an agreement with Doosan. Um, through which Doosan can make a catch equity investment in new scale and Doosan would would supply key components. Um, so this demonstrates the potential opportunities in bilateral civil nuclear cooperation. Could you share the background and objectives for Doosan in entering into this agreement? Thank you for asking regarding the new scale. Uh, Doosan thought that new scale SMR is the innovative design which enhance the safety and economy evolutionary. We are believing that new scale SMR will be a game changer in energy market to encounter climate change. So Tucson decided 
to be a strategic partner as a manufacturer. Uscale has state-of-art design, and Tucson has a manufacturing capability, including forging. So we will be a strong synergy. Tucson completed the investment of $44 billion to Uscale in December of 2019 with the Korean financial investors. This means that Korean financial investors believe the value of Uscale SMR and the relationship with Tucson. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Hopkins, um, as CEO of NewScale, can you speak to NewScale's partnership with Tucson and how you view potential investors? Certainly. Um, and it just didn't happen overnight. Tucson probably spent well over a year, if not a year and a half, doing due diligence. They spent a significant amount of time in our data room. They made numerous trips to our operations center in Corvallis, Oregon. And we also went and visited their capacity in their manufacturing facilities in Busan. And it became evident it's, it's state of the art. And for us to be successful as an industry, wherever we work, we've got to be cost competitive. I, I'm very convinced our machine will work and do what it said we say we can do at 77 megawatts per unit. And um, at the end of the day, you know, where we've been plagued as an industry is cost overruns and schedule overruns. And we got to prove it differently. And you need this is a global play and the intent and objective of new skill. We're not going to build one off plants. If we get the capacity to execute, we're going to have two or three, four of these things going on at any one time. We already have multiple memorandums of understanding in Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Central Europe, and we see that expanding and we need strong strategic partners. And with Doosan, it was more than just a supplier relationship. They are a strategic investor into new scale and will help take us globally, you know, in parts of the world that we probably wouldn't have the opportunity without a company like Doosan. So it, it's been very successful and it's going to create a lot of jobs in this country as we continue. Our first customer is, in, is going to be at Idaho National Lab. It's the Utah Association of Municipal Power. And Doosan will have a significant piece of helping build our modules, as will BWXT in Canada. So um, we anticipate it's going to be a very strong partnership. They participate on our board and uh, the trust factor between two companies. And I'm speaking of not only New Scale, Dusa, but also Floor Corporation, who will be providing the EPC. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I love this notion of these two companies and plus, plus Floor as well, but these partnerships that allow the companies to go globally to places where they might not have otherwise gone. Um, and I want to go, I want to come back in a couple of minutes to the question of exports to third party countries. But before we do that, I want to go back to you, um, Mr. Ryu, and ask about the joint fuel cycle study. So Korea and the United States are conducting joint research into nuclear on the nuclear fuel cycle. And both countries believe that they'll be able to advance significant technological advancements and cooperation in this field um, of spent fuel management. So can you talk a little bit about the status and future plans for the JFCS? Thank you, Jennifer. Um... Kerry has developed a pyroprocessing technology as part of, a, part of an option for a safe and effective long-term management of spent fuel since 1996. Uh, as I said earlier, the RK, the United States have jointly have been jointly conducting the JFCS since 2011. The, the US and the Korean experts have been performing uh, integrated tests with oxide spent fuel for recycle to a fast reactor at Idaho National Laboratory. So they have produced a lot of results and accomplishment to assess pyroprocessing technology. Uh, in this regard, Kerry believes that uh, it has confirmed the possibility of pyroprocessing technology through recovery of uranium and transit uranium elements from the spent nuclear fuel to fuel fabrication for fast reactor fuel and irradiation at the Idaho National Lab advanced to test reactor in a technical manner. If an internal review of pyroprocessing technology in Korea are good this year, Kerry will do its best to, to, to 
do its best to, to develop bioprocessing technology as a technically reliable option for spent fuel management in Korea in, mid, in the mid-2030s. The research bioprocessing technology in ROK. ROK has to consult with the United States to get the programmatic consent through the high-level bilateral commission articulated in ROK, ROK US 123 agreement. Uh, in, in this regard, Kerry, uh, together with the United States, would like to develop the bioprocessing technology with the highest level of nuclear non-proliferation that minimize, minimizes human intervention, including automated operations and monitoring with the innovative technology such as artificial intelligence. Through this technology, I think it's, we can provide a global solution to the management of spent fuel. It is a, a concern of all countries that, are, that operate nuclear power plants. Uh, that's my hope. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and so I want to go back to this idea of third party countries, because I think that, you know, if you accept, and I think that we do generally, that the, the there will be great demand from emerging nuclear energy markets. The question, I think, is really who is going to meet that demand? And I would argue that it really has to be the United States and, in a, and U.S. allies together. Um, and so I want to talk about civil nuclear exports. Um, and I want to go back to you, Mr. Green. Can you give us a sense of the U.S. civil nuclear export program as it stands today um, and the role of bilateral cooperation in strengthening that program? Uh, sure, Jennifer. Uh, and I just got a note that my connection is unstable, so hopefully it uh, lasts for this. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, I think that opportunities uh, to strengthen the U.S. export program can build on the uh, experience in the UAE with the Baraka project, uh, that even though uh, uh, Korean vendors uh, led that project, U.S. suppliers uh, participated in a meaningful way and obtained substantial economic value, uh, that you know, future export customers may decide on either U.S. or ROK uh, designs and technologies uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think bilateral cooperation can open up opportunities to generate value for suppliers in both countries. And I think, you know, that's a kind of critical uh, uh, view to take in terms of uh, in terms of both proceeding with uh, bilateral activity, but also, as you mentioned, uh, strengthening the offerings from both countries. Uh, bilateral uh, uh, cooperation would create or could create uh, opportunities to join forces in export financing to, to increase the ability uh, to, to offer financing to customers and uh, offsetting what uh, Russia and China are, are potentially offering to their customers. And Jennifer, I, I, I know that you've, uh, you've done work in, in this area and talked about uh, the value of uh, combining efforts in export financing. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, bilateral cooperation in R&D and, and uh, development support will uh, help in de developing and commercializing advanced nu nuclear technologies uh, for future exports. And some of those opportunities may be in the near term, as Mr. Hopkins mentioned. So those would be the points that I would offer up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. And by the way, to our audience, I want to encourage you to submit your own questions for the Q&A. At the bottom of your Zoom screens, there's a Q&A feature. So please type your questions in. Um, and Mr. Kang, I want to go to you and ask, the civil nuclear cooperation between Korea and the United States is crucial for the future of the two countries' nuclear energy industries. What do you think is the opportunity for new cooperation to advance the ROK US civil nuclear cooperation? Okay. Uh, Russia and China are dominating new nuclear power plant market in the world. Since United States and Korea have a long relationship we have to work closely to encounter Russia and China. There are lots of opportunities in Poland, Czech, Saudi Arabia, and UK. So United States and Korea should select appropriate model 
which fit to the customer country's need and cooperate with each other with its own strengths to win-win. The strength of each country was summarized in Peter Green's report. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, getting back to this idea of a demand signal from third party countries, Mr. Hopkins, can you talk a little bit about the demand signal that you are seeing from third countries for nuclear energy technologies that are sold by the United States and our allies? Yeah, by third countries, I'm assuming you mean in non EU countries. Um, Mr. Green said two, something that was very important earlier. We're starting to see, as you know, XM now has a quorum. Uh, they support nuclear. Uh, the, de the Development Finance Corporation, formerly the Overseas Private Investment Corp, have dropped their nuclear prohibition. So with those combined resources, we can now compete against Russia and China. It's not a total level playing field, but it certainly enhances our, our ability to compete in a global basis. And World Bank needs to step up. They need to understand with the countries that they're working with in the development part of the world, what advanced reactors could do to support what is needed in that part of the world, be it at Sub-Saharan Africa or whatever. And what we're seeing is we're getting, we have two MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding. They're not legally binding, but it's at the very senior levels of government in Southeast Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they want and they need, because they're pragmatic about energy disrupt or global dis climate disruption, and they have an energy need. They need clean water. They want to get the produce out of the field to put in refrigeration. So I see a groundswell building. What we need to do as a country, I believe, I want to get one module up and running to showcase the world because what people typically say, and we've been through a lot of the, you know, you'll never get there, you'll never do this. Well, you know, the advanced reactor community is doing it. We need to show that we are going to be commercially viable. We're the safest product that's going to be out there. And we're going to be, this is going to be a major, I, I believe, uh, U.S. technologies are going to be all over the world. And we need partners, like I said, though, because you're going to have in-country content requirements wherever we go. We're going to utilize local labor, obviously. There's countries that love to see advanced manufacturing facility in their own country, and we need to help them get there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hawkins. It's fascinating. Um, I have a question from the audience um, about public opinion in Korea towards nuclear energy to either of our Korean speakers. And the question is, what is the view from inside of the Korean nuclear energy industry regarding the post moon era? Do you foresee a new Korean nuclear renaissance on the horizon or is the outlook bleak? How is Korean public support for nuclear? And who would like to take that question? Okay, I will answer about that. I think uh, at this moment, the government is uh, doing the phase out of nuclear, but once they will recognize the importance of nuclear, so suddenly one day there will be nuclear renaissance in Korea. So we are be preparing for that renaissance in Korea. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ryu, would, like, would you like to talk about public opinion towards nuclear in Korea? And I believe you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Uh, okay. I think it's a uh, public acceptance for the operating of nuclear power plants uh, are good. But uh, in some parts, I think it's uh, public acceptance is uh, difficult to get because uh, some, the, there, there are some the safety concern to operate to the nuclear power plant. I think it's, uh, that's why we needed to develop an advanced reactor because the advanced reactor based on the, the small, small modular, such as a small modular reactor as uh, uh, intrinsic passive safety systems. So I think it's, uh, that's why the US and Korea the R&D corporation are needed to develop the advanced uh, nuclear reactor, especially for the, the mitigating the safety concerns. Thank you. Thank you. And something perhaps sort of similar, but another question from the audience. 
Um, the United States has excelled at safe and efficient operation of reactors, but has stumbled in the management of new construction. At the same time, the Republic of Korea has excelled in managing construction costs and on schedule completion of reactor construction projects. So how can Republic of Korea construction management expertise be applied to future US construction projects? And that's to anyone. But Jennifer, I, if this is John Hopkins. Uh, you know, as I said before, it's critically important that all of us are commercially viable. In, in the case of New Scale, we believe it used to be about on large as economies of scale. Now it's about economies of small. There's a lot of there's a lot within the safety within the uh, a large mega uh, megawatt reactor. There's a lot of components we don't need. A lot of the reactor components or a lot of the components we have in New Scale right now are in fact are off the shelf. Our, our urban generators, our skid mount units that are used in industry today that can be brought in. We're going to build these in a factory. That's going to cut out a significant amount of cost. So what's left is this actual civil in the field. And each one of our units is independent of one another. So from a learning perspective, as you build the first put the first module in, you're going to replicate that if it's four times or six times, whatever the customer wants. So you can quickly get from a first of a kind to an end of a kind. So I, I and then it, there's a lot of lessons learned that came out of Volvo in summer. Uh, there's a lot of lessons learned, as you mentioned, that came out of Korea building Baraka at UAE. I, I've had numerous conversations with uh, with the UAE, UAE folks and, and also with Korea and what they've done differently. So it's uh, our ability to learn from one another, and and I'm pretty bullish on the fact we're gonna we have to be competitive. You know, as I said before, in this country, our competition's gas. But what we're seeing from a gas perspective, it's hard to compete when you're two to three dollars per million BTU. But if you're looking at these states now that are very concerned about greenhouse gas emissions, you know, a lot of us could we could help load follow a lot of these renewable facilities with no greenhouse gas emissions. So again, as I said before, Bruce in the pudding, but we will be competitive as an industry. So Mr. Hopkins, I wanna pick up on something that you said earlier um, that all eyes right now, I think are on the new Biden administration, which has committed to net zero by 2050. But you know, the question I think really is what will they do? What will this new administration do to bolster nuclear energy and especially the civil nuclear export program of the United States. Um, and so I want to ask each speaker from your own standpoint, what are, are you looking for from the new Biden administration and what opportunities for civil nuclear cooperation exist in the new Biden administration between the United States and the Republic of Korea? So again, as the author of the new report, uh, Mr. Green, I'll turn to you first. All right. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so I would say, uh, as we've talked about exploring cooperation in, in uh, research uh, development and demonstration, uh, I think that that's a you know an outstanding opportunity uh, and uh, exploring uh, the possibility of of uh, joint activity on uh, the versatile test reactor if that's pursued. Uh, continuation of support for uh, advanced reactors and and I think uh, you know that will generate uh, opportunities for. Uh, uh, cooperation uh, between countries. And then finally, uh, cooperation and export financing to help us uh, compete with uh, Russia and China and strengthen our export opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Ryu, I want to go back to you and ask, what are you looking for um, from the new Biden administration? Thank you. Um, uh, one of the one of the Biden administration priority agendas is climate change response. So, as an energy source of clean power, nuclear power is, is an indif indispensable energy source for responding to climate change and uh, achieving of a carbon neutral economy in 2050 in both countries. However, both countries are facing hard, harder than ever in the nuclear energy field, while China and Russia are increasing their share of the global nuclear plant market. 
it is not easy for Korea and the United States to get on to gain on ASEAN in the global market due to the uh, several reasons, such as the supply chain decline and uh, some kind of uh, difficulty to the, get the export to new nuclear the power plants. So in this sense, I think that uh, in order for the Korea and the United States to have a new technology technological leadership, they must strengthen the nuclear and the collaboration in the advanced nuclear reactor field, as I said earlier, and secure the competitiveness in the future nuclear market through the R&D cooperations. Uh, let me, the example one, this, uh, the development of a hybrid energy system combined with the SMR and the renewable energy that can solve the safety concerns of nuclear reactors and overcome the, the intermittent nature of nuclear renewable energy uh, will be a good topic for R&D cooperation the, between the two countries, especially uh, in order to protect our planet and the sustain economic growth. I think it's a, if uh, this is my thought is uh, Biden administration just uh, began. So as a starting point, I think that the nuclear power sector uh, should be on the should be put on the agenda for upcoming the RKUS summit to materialize the establishment of a win win nuclear strategy partnership between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ryu and Mr. Kang. I want to go to you and ask, um, what signals are you looking for from the new U.S. administration? Okay, uh, Biden administration and Moon administration both think the climate change is very seriously. So I think the role of nuclear will be very important to encounter climate change. So the United States, the SMR. Uh, who is the frontier of uh, SMR and advanced uh, reactor can be cooperated with Korea to build modules and construct. Also, United States and Korea can cooperate each other as a one team to explore the large nuclear power plant in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, Mr. Hopkins, I know we've had opportunities um, in the past to talk about this, but now we're a couple months in um, into the Biden administration. And so the same question again to you. And Mr. Hopkins, I believe you're still on mute. Yeah, I had conversations today with many folks and the general sense within this administration, obviously decarbonization, climate change is on the forefront and priority. In, and we believe that there's gonna be a big push to get advanced nuclear moving forward. We've already started to see it with the ADR, ADR, ARDP program, but I mentioned this once before, Jennifer, a great success story has been renewables. If over the last decade, $51 billion have been provided to solar and wind to get them down to where they're extremely cost competitive today. They're still dealing with intermittency issues. They're still dealing with large mass, large lad mass. But if some of those type of incentives could be applied to the advanced reactor community, I think the returns of investment by our government and for this country would be phenomenal. So we just need to continue in with the efforts of the Atlanta Council and what you do. Um, I'm always extremely grateful every time you ask me to present because it's uh, it's an opportunity to voice what I believe is going to be a resurgence in nuclear in this country, and not only here, but elsewhere. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we're approaching um, the end of the hour, but I wanted to ask again, each of you just quickly, um, if you could say perhaps what's the single most um, you know, the biggest challenge that you see facing this new renaissance that I do think we're seeing in nuclear energy technologies, but what's the greatest challenge? And perhaps if you have any ideas to how to get past it, um, Mr. Green, starting with you. 
Sure, I, I think actually Mr. Hopkins uh, previewed it in a sense. I, the challenge is, the, is you know, pr proving out the, uh, the, the cost effectiveness of the technology. That's really what the challenge has been. I think, uh, frankly, Baraka went a long way towards demonstrating that uh, nuclear could be built on time and, and on budget. Um, now we're trying to do it with these uh, more advanced reactors, smaller reactors, and I think um, you know, just getting the getting the demonstrations done uh, on time and uh, on budget that, you know, that's that's the biggest challenge. Thank you. And Mr. Ryu, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge right now and how would you overcome it if you could? Uh, in the R&D aspects, I think it's uh, the biggest challenge uh, of the demonstration and deployment of advanced nuclear reactor. Uh, there are many types of uh, advanced reactor uh, to be developing, to be developed. So, but uh, at this stage, uh, there are some conceptual or basic design stage. So, I think it's uh, we uh, we need to overcome the some from this stage to demonstration and deployment. So, I think it's. Uh, that's why we need to R&D the corporations the, between the, the two countries to develop this and to demonstrate uh, the advanced reactor. So I think it's uh, maybe the in Korea or the, in the United States. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I hope the demonstration will be uh, soon. Will be the made soon between the corporations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Kang, to you. I think the biggest challenge in, in new nuclear power plant construction is the financing. Most countries who want to construct new power plant need the money. And the should so United States and Korea work together how to we can financing them sufficiently. For example, United States uh, EFC to involve in the financing is good case. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Hopkins, the final question to you. Yeah, I think they've covered a lot. I'd have to say also that society's acceptance of new nuclear and advanced nuclear, we still got a ways to go. Um, that, you know, if you think of any given technology, the advancement of an automobile over 40 years from 40 years ago to where we are today or an airplane, nuclear is also advanced. That's why we're called advanced nuclear. The, the safety safeguards within these nuclear facilities we're talking about today, arguably there would have not been a Fukushima if many of these new technologies had been deployed. So getting society to get how we can better educate. And I think it starts a lot with the youth and what we do in our schools. And what I'm finding when I go to universities and speak, most of our kids are pretty pragmatic. And when you ask about the need for nuclear, if we really want to impress upon and making right on, on carbon emissions and et cetera, two thirds of the hands go up and, and say, we accept the fact that we need nuclear. So it's just that continued educational process. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I'll end by saying that I think that in in all of these challenges that each of you have raised, I think that one of the key tools that we have in fighting those challenges and overcoming them is really working together, um, whether it's financing or on public education. Um, I think that we can really put our, our minds together and our efforts together and make real progress. Um, so with that said, um, I think this, uh, we're, we're at, the, at the end of our time, and I want to urge everyone, please, please download and read the report by Stephen Green. It is truly excellent um, and represents the labor of many, many months. So please read it. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you to our panelists, to Mr. Green and Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Ryu and Mr. Kang. And thank you especially to Ambassador Tom Graham. And thank you so much to our audience. Um, I'd also like to thank Ambassador Richard Morningstar and Randy Bell for deciding about three years ago now 
that the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council needed a nuclear energy portfolio, which I'm honored to lead. Thank you especially to my colleagues, Emily Burlinghouse, Laura Macedo, and Roger Morales, without whom events like this could not take place. So please join us again soon and stay safe and well. And I hope to see you all perhaps in person um, within the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you.